Hello there guys, today we're going to talk about Sona. She is a very special champion to me because she was my main long before I started playing Janna. But even though the Wind Goddess now is my main, I have never stopped liking Sona. The very first skin I've ever got was a Sona skin and it remains one of my favorite skins in the game today. But without further ado, let's start with the guide. Sona is a support champion that is picked for her powerful laning phase and for all the utility she brings to a teamfight through her ult and the spamming of her other abilities. Her biggest weaknesses are being extremely squishy, so she relies a lot on good positioning and being a very mana-hungry champion. Sona's Q, Hymn of Valor. Sona sends two balls of sound that damage to nearby enemies, prioritizing champions over minions and monsters. Additionally, Sona gains an aura that grants her and any ally champion in range an empowered auto-attack. In lane, this is the ability you're going to be using more often. Be aggressive and harass your enemies while being careful with your positioning. Whenever possible, don't forget to give the blue aura to your ED carry so he too can deal more damage. Sona's Hymn of Valor isn't as relevant in the mid and late game as it is in the laning phase because her primary role is to serve as a pillar and not as a damage dealer. But it is still useful to poke enemies down and help your allies burst enemies down. Sona's W, Aria of Perseverance. Sona plays a song that heals herself and the most injured nearby ally champion. Additionally, Sona gains an aura that grants her and any ally in range a shield. This ability provides decent sustain for you and your team but during the early levels, don't spam it because it costs a lot of mana. Also, don't forget to use your shield to mitigate damage the same way you would use Janna's E. Sona's E, Song of Celerity. Sona plays a song that grants her bonus movement speed. This effect is granted to any ally in range of Sona's aura. This ability helps you roam around the map faster, get to lane faster, dodge skill shots, and help your team escape or chase someone down. It's very important to note that this ability does not trigger if you are under a slowing effect. So if you are being chased and someone slows you, don't waste your mana. Sona's ultimate, Crescendo. Sona plays her ultimate chord, stunning enemies and making them dance in place. In lane, level 6 is your power spike because your ult grants you the all-in potential. In a 2v2 fight, try your best to hit both targets. In a teamfight scenario, you should use your ult according to the situation. If your team is ahead, you should mostly position yourself to hit as many people as possible. If you are too far away or the angle isn't good, you can use your flash to reposition yourself. However, if your team is losing, avoid flashing in aggressively and save your ult to peel for your carries or to stun the most fat people on the enemy team. Keep in mind that Sona's R can also be used to disengage bad fights. Sona's passive is power cord. Whenever Sona casts 3 abilities, she gets an empowered attack that deals bonus damage and has a different effect depending on which ability Sona activated last. The Q passive is blue and deals bonus magic damage. This passive is the reason why Sona is such a big bully in lane, and the reason why she deals so much damage despite building support items. You can use it on structures such as towers, inhibitors and the nexus in order to take them down faster. Same thing with minions and monsters. Sona's W passive is green, and when used on an opponent, it reduces their damage output for a short time. Use it mainly on opponents with high damage output to protect your carries. Here, through my W passive and exhaust, I'm able to save Jin from Twitch's ultimate. It can be cast on monsters as well. Sona's E passive is purple, and when cast on an enemy, it reduces their movement speed for a short time. It is primarily used to chase enemies down and to score kills for your team, but it can also be used to slow enemies and peel for your allies. On a side note, Sona's passive gets blocked by abilities like Pantheon's passive, and if you use your passive to clear a ward, you don't lose it. Almost always I max Q first on Sona for a stronger poke on a lower cooldown. Then W for the healing and the shielding. 
The reason why I max E last is because even though a burst of movement speed can be good, the other two are just much more important. Like all ultimates, I put a point in R every time I can. However, on some occasion it's viable to max W first, followed by Q, E and then R. Learning Sona's combos allows you to maximize your damage output and engage trade and peel more efficiently. These two are Sona's most basic combos and the ones you are going to use more often to harass in lane. This one is useful for when you are going to attack the enemy and the enemy attacks back. The shield and the heal will help you win the trade. Don't do it too often early on because your W costs a lot of mana. Save it for abilities that deal a lot of damage like Nami's W. You can also use the passive W on the enemy and then harass him for a similar effect. This combo of E plus Q is very useful to harass enemies with skill shots because the movement speed helps you avoid them. Alt plus Q passive is the most basic all-in combo you can do. You can flash any Florentine range to ult. Also, sometimes you can use the passive from W to reduce the enemy damage in the fight. Using ult followed by the passive from E helps your allies catch up to the enemy. However, be careful not to overlap the two CC. Sona is a champion with a very versatile kit, so she fits into pretty much any composition. Early game composition, poke composition, heal composition, peel composition, you name it. But the one she fits the best in is an AoE composition, mainly because of her massive AoE stun. Also make sure that your lane partner is someone with all-in potential or that can poke alongside you. Just like I said before, Sona is a champion that does well in pretty much every situation. However, Burst is her biggest enemy. Sona's strength comes from spamming her abilities and her ult. If you can kill Sona before she can heal or speed up her allies, her team becomes much weaker. For this reason, I don't like to pick Sona into champions that can burst her down very quickly, like Leblanc or Talon. And I also avoid bot lanes that have a very strong all-in potential and that can burst Sona down before she can react, like Leona and Draven. There are essentially two ways to play Sona. The Green Sona build, which focuses on maxing W first and is overall more defensive, and the Blue Sona build, in which you max Q first and build items to deal more damage. For each playstyle, there are different set of runes that you can use. Keep in mind that each rune set can be used interchangeably depending on the situation. Sorcery as primary is hands down the best choice for Sona. Summon Aries the Keystone for more poke in the shield. Mana Flow Band to help you with your early game mana problems. Celerity works very well with your E and Scorch is great for the poke in lane. Inspiration is what I take as secondary when I play the Blue Sona build. I take Cosmic Insight 100% of the time because the CDR is too good on Sona and I alternate between Magical Footwear and Stopwatch. Taking Resolve as secondary is always good even if you are playing the Blue Sona build. Bone Plating helps you survive the laning phase and Revitalize boosts your healing. You can also take Revitalize and Chrysalis if you aren't that afraid of dying and want to be a bit more aggressive. Taking Chrysalis and Bone Plating is also a viable choice. There is yet another rune page I rarely use, but is also viable. They call it Kleptosona. You should play with these runes when you cannot attack a lot, so choose it against lanes that you easily dominate. Go Kleptomancy, of course, because when you auto-attack you get a lot of gold, magical footwear, futures market, cosmic insights, and secondary sorcery with mana flow band and scorch. When it comes to summoner spells, flash is a must take because you are immobile and you need a way to reposition yourself in a team fight or to escape bad situations. As a secondary summoner spell, ignite is my favorite because it helps you have a lot more kill pressure. If your lane partner takes TP or something of sorts, you should take heal. Exhaust is a fairly unpopular summoner spell at the moment because it has been nerfed over the course of many patches. I rarely take it, and if I do, it's because I feel like we really can't win bot lane, or if the enemy team has more than two assassins. 
Sonia gets along the best with lane bullies that can keep up with her aggressiveness. This includes champions with high burst damage or strong poke. Misfortune, Ezreal, Zaya, Varus, Ash, Caitlyn, Jin, Draven, Lucian and Kaisa all have good synergy with Sona. The ones at the top have the benefit of having an ult that synergizes really well with Sona's. Imagine that Sona ults and Misfortune ults on top. It's a deadly combo in a teamfight. If you are one of those that still plays mages in the bot lane, Brand goes really well with Sona because of his poke and his all-in potential. Jinx, Tristan and Kalista also have good synergy with Sona. The downside to Kalista, in my opinion, is that her ult can put Sona in danger. There is a difference between throwing a Taric to the middle of the enemy team, who is very tanky, and throwing a squishy Sona. Vayne, Twitch and Kog'Maw don't have a very good synergy with Sona because they have a very weak early game and as such they can't really help her keep up the pressure in lane. Plus they work better with supports that have hard peel like Janna to keep them alive in the mid and late game. Just like I said time and time again, Sona is a very oppressive laner, but she has an easier time dealing with some matchups than with others. For the most part, Sona has an easy time against champions that have a weak laning phase and struggles against someone that can burst her down or has stronger poke. Please keep in mind that how the bot lane goes depends on the skill of four different people, jungle ganks and robes. Also, just because I find some matchups harder doesn't mean that you will be of the same opinion. Even if Janna maxes her W, your poke is still stronger than hers. Also, she can only shield one person and your Q hits two people. Plus, you can destroy her shield with your passive Q. You can also stop her ult with your ult. As long as you don't let Soraka hit her Q, you won't sustain and not poke her. Level 6 if you want to wall in, focus Soraka and ignite her early so she can heal herself back up. Bard isn't a super tough matchup to deal with because your poke and your heal are stronger than his. Just don't let him stun you and watch out for his magical journey because he can set up very good ganks. At level 6 he is very squishy so you can be all in him with your ult and ignite. Sona shouldn't have a very hard time against Karma. If she hits her mantra Q, she could all in you level 2. But if you can dodge that, you ought to sustain her naturally. The champions on the first row are a little bit more of a problem to Sona because they have access to hard CC pre level 6, so it all comes down to your ability to dodge their skill shots. If you do get caught early, you can die. Try to destroy Morgana's black shield with your passive before ulting. And even if you win lane against Tarik and Zillion, their ults are gonna be really annoying in teamfights. The matchup Lulu Sona is very AD carry reliant because they are both very strong in poke, even if Sona has a bit of an upper hand since she has access to heals and Lulu does not. They are also equally strong in teamfights. Tom Kench is really annoying with his cube poke and if he has an aggressive AD carry, he can all in you early. You can't really punish him too hard because he is very tanky and in teamfights he can just eat his carries and run away. He is really annoying to deal with. For the most part, these champions are difficult for Sona to deal with because they are very tanky and have very powerful all-ins. They can be deadly if they use level 2 advantage and get you out of position, especially if they have a powerful AD carry. However, if Sona is able to dodge their skill shots and box them down, she can win lane. If possible, ask your jungler for help. The poke from Bran, Zyra and Fiddlesticks is stronger than yours and if they get their combos off on you, they can kill you early. Plus, they deal a lot more damage in teamfights than you. The same applies to other mage supports like Xerath and Vel'Koz. Leona, Annie and Blitzcrank are the toughest matchups you can find on bot lane. Sure, you can dodge Blitzcrank's hook and Leona's skill shots, but if they hit them, you're pretty much dead. As Sona, there is no counterplay to Annie. At level 6, she's just going to flash, ult, ignite you and there is nothing you can do to stop her. Try to play as safe as you can and ask for jungle ganks. She is very squishy and has no escape, so she can die easily. When it comes to AD carries, I advise you to pick Sona into weak laners that you can abuse. It's true that they scale really hard into the late game, but so do you, so that isn't much of a problem. And yes, I believe you can pick Sona into Yasuo. There isn't much he can do against the Sona that is constantly pressuring and zoning him. Make sure that you ought to attack him first to get rid of his shield and then poke him. At level 6, try to stay away from minions and dodge his knockup and he should be fine. Avoid champions that can burst you down like Draven and Brand, champions with previous wounds like Misfortune and Varus, and Swain and Bigari because he deals an absurd amount of damage, can all in you, and is overall too tanky for you to deal with, especially with his ult.
For the blue zone I build, I start with spell thieves, 3 health pots, and a trinket. During my first and second bags, I upgrade my spell thieves to Frostfang by a tier so I can stack it throughout the game and some health pots. When you have your 3 wards, don't forget to buy the sweeper and every time you back, buy at least one vision ward. After you have your tier, you can buy basic boots. After this, you can upgrade them early or wait until later. I usually go for Ionian because they help a lot with CDR, but you can also go for Sorceress or even Mobility. Athens followed by Arden Sensor are your main items. After this, I usually go for AP. Lich Pain is an amazing item on Sona because it works really well with your passive and helps you burst people down. Twin Shadows, Shirelias and Rabadons are also good choices. These are some situational items that you can buy. Eye of the Watchers is very useful if you find yourself getting pressed down too quickly in mid-game teamfights. The health it provides help you keep yourself alive for longer. Upgrade it right after you get your tier. Archangel Staff is also a good choice if you find yourself dying too quickly. Only upgrade it if you are getting super hard focused, because when fully stacked it grants you a shield. Redemption is a safer option if your team is losing really hard and you need that heal in a teamfight. Mikhail's Crucible can be bought instead of Athens if the enemy team has extremely strong CC and your carries are constantly dying because of it. Locket of the Iron Solari is an item I almost never buy because it scales with health and that's not a good stat on Sona. But if the enemy team has a lot, and I mean a lot, of AoE damage, you can buy it to keep your allies safe. Here is an example of a full blue Sona build. When it comes to the green Sona build, keep in mind that you should only use it if you have a duo partner and you really really trust him to carry the game, because it's all about healing him and keeping him safe. Once again, I start with spell thieves, 3 health pots and a trinket. On the first time I visit the shop, I get frostfang, some health pots and like every time I back, a vision ward. If you need, you can fully upgrade your gold item and get basic boots. When you upgrade your boots, you can go for Ionian or Mobility, which is what I go for most of the time, depending on if my team is losing or winning respectively, but if the enemy team has a lot of hard CC and you are dying a lot because of it, you can get Merc Threats. This time around, Redemption and Ardent Sensor are your core items. Mikkel's Crucible and Locket of Yar and Solari are good if you need magic resist, but avoid buying a locket for the reasons I already presented. If the enemy team is extremely AD heavy, you can consider buying Zix. If you don't need Mikael's to get rid of CC, you can buy Athens because it's always an amazing item on Sona. The AP items you buy should be more utility focused, but if you are stomping really hard, you can still go for more aggressive items like Lichbane. Here is an example of a full green Sona build. The first thing that you want to do with Sona is queue once in base and then queue again when you are leashing for the jungler. In case you don't leash for the jungler, just queue when you are waiting for the minions to spawn. The reason for this is that you have two stacks of your passive ready and when you get to lane you will chunk the enemy level 1 with the third activation of your queue. You always start queue on Sona regardless of the situation, so in case of invade just try to damage the enemy with your queue and autos. This is more of a general tip and not really a tip for Sona, but if you aren't helping your jungler do the buff, Try to go to lane later, so the enemies don't know where your jungler started. This is very good for you, because it doesn't give away the position of your jungler and it forces the enemy team to play scared. People in solo queue, especially at lower ranks, aren't really concerned with hiding their jungler, so you can use this to your advantage. If the bot lane comes to lane late, it means that they were leashing for the jungler, so that means that the jungler is going to clear the bot side and then head top. When he reaches level 3, which is around 3 minutes, he is going to be topside and he is more than likely going to either uh, gank mid or top, which means that you are going to be safe bot side and you can play more aggressively. If he does start topside, be careful because around 3 minutes he can come bot, so play more safe around that time. There are exceptions to this rule, of course, if you are against a jungler that only ganks at level 6, like Master Yi, um, you should be more safe because he can't really gank unless the enemy bot lane is someone that can engage for him like Leona. There are also junglers that can gank at level 2 like Lee Sin, 
So sometimes even if he starts bot side, what he can do is go immediately bot and the enemy team can engage on you and he can either kill you early or force your flash. Speaking of flashes, if you guys got invaded and you wasted your summoner spells, be very careful because the enemy jungler, no matter who he is, can just gank you while you are still level 1 and you will have no way to escape. There are still smart junglers that will gang you regardless when you least expect it, so the best thing to do is to keep the river bushes warded. The reason why I went more in depth into this is because Sauna is a very squishy champion with no ways of escaping, so if you disrespect these things, uh, smart junglers will make your life a living hell. Now more about Sauna and their laning phase. Level 1, when you are walking to lane with your ID carry, uh, avoid going through the bushes because sometimes the enemy is hiding there and try to wall in you level 1. Just take the safer paths through the jungle. Once you get to lane, the first thing you should do is start auto attacking the minion so you can get to level 2 faster. But how do you know who will get to level 2 first? Well, if you kill the first wave and the three melee creeps of the second wave, you will get the level advantage. If you manage to do it, put yourself in front of the minion wave and force the enemy to back off. If instead your opponents get level 2 first, just back off for a little bit and wait for your level 2. As I'm sure you all know, uh, your job as support is to give space for your ID carry to farm while being as annoying as you can to the enemy bot lane. If you are in a matchup where you have the advantage, you can just stay in front of your ID carry and poke the hell out of their bot lane. You should always focus your poke on the enemy ID carry unless you are against someone like Soraka who you should be focusing all the time. Creating pressure isn't the only reason why you focus the enemy ED carry. He only has one health pot and the support has three, so he runs out of sustain a lot faster. The best time to harass the enemy ED carry or AP carry, I don't know anymore, is when he is going to last hit a minion. He has to choose between being damaged by you or back off and give up on the minion. Sometimes you don't even need to poke him to zone him. If he is very low and you just run up to him, he is just going to automatically back off because he is afraid of you. Don't forget to control the lane bushes because it really creates a lot of pressure for your enemies. Don't forget that you can also harass the enemy support, but they usually have a lot more damage than the AD carry, so be careful and don't get hit by their skill shots. It's especially good to harass them if they get out of position. If instead you are in a bad matchup, stay beside your AD carry and only poke if you see it's safe. And please don't overextend. If you are against a poke lane like Lulu, try to make them focus their poke on you. Be careful with the amount of damage you let them do to you, though. This doesn't only take pressure off your lane partner, it also lets him keep his health pot for longer. Between all the poking and the healing, don't forget to keep an eye on the minimap and keep track of the enemy jungler, which buffs he has and which level he is at. It's also very important to keep track of enemy abilities and summoner cooldowns and keep track of their items as well. This information will become more and more valuable the higher you climb, so don't forget to write all you know in chat. In lane, Sona's main power spikes are her level 1 and her level 6, so once you get your ultimate, if you see an opportunity, let your AD carry know with your pings and go in. It is especially easy to all in enemies that are out of mana, are at a level disadvantage or are out of position. People are often careless with these things, so it's up to you to keep track of them and punish the enemies for their mistakes. I will now show an example of this in the video. Now let's talk about the minion wave. Everyone who is watching this probably knows that minions are important. You just don't know how important. Knowing how to use the minions to your advantage will help you win a lot more games. We already know that hard pushing the minions level 1 will give you an advantage, but should you keep on always pushing the minions throughout the laning phase? First we must know how minions work. They spawn every 30 seconds and every 3 waves a cannon minion spawns. The wave can basically adopt 5 positions in lane. They can be in your tower range, outside of your tower range, which is next to the tower but not so close that they get destroyed by it, in the middle of the lane, outside of enemy tower range and in enemy tower range. Each position holds advantages and disadvantages. When the minions are under your tower, the first thing you have to worry about is help your ID carry last hit. 
Melee minions take 2 tower shots and 1 auto attack from your ready carry, so you should not touch those. The ranged minions take 1 tower shot, 1 auto attack from you, and then your ready carry can last hit them. This is a very general rule, because the minions aren't always at the perfect health to be last hit, so it's up to you to learn when you should auto attack them and when you should not. It's all about practicing. Also, a thing that causes confusion to many supports is knowing which minion the tower is going to attack next, because it seems like it chooses randomly, but that's not true. The tower attacks whichever minion is closest to it. In general, if you are under tower, you should be safe, but you are putting yourself at risk of 3 men and 4 men tower dives, so it's a good idea to ward the bush behind the tower if you are constantly getting pushed in. Right outside your tower is one of the best places to have your minions in because you are at the safety of your tower and the enemies are super pushed in, which means that they are at the mercy of a jungle gank. If you are winning lane, this is what you should do, freeze the minions right outside your tower because you can just stay in front of the wave and zone the enemies with no risk for you and your ready carry. And how do you freeze a lane? You have to look at the number of minions on your wave and on the enemy wave and try to keep them even. This is also the position you should have the enemy minions at if your ready carry is out of lane. Just stand in front of the wave and body block it until your wave arrives. I like to call it farm saving because you are saving the farm for your ready carry. If you need to do this but are very low, you can go in and out of the bush so you aren't constantly targeted by the enemy minions. Having the wave in the middle of the lane is what you should do when you are even with the enemy or when they have abilities that get stopped by minions, because as long as you position correctly, they should not be able to hit you. When the wave is frozen outside of the enemy tower, it's usually a very bad thing for you because the enemies can just zone you and you are pushed, so you are at the mercy of a jungle gank. If the enemy ADC died and the support is trying to save the minions, as long as you aren't too low or aren't in danger, you can go there and force him to back off so the minions die to the tower. Keep in mind that the enemy laners might try to do the same to you, so if you feel like you aren't safe, uh, just back off and give up. Like we already said, to get the wave under the enemy tower you have to hard push it. When the minions are under the enemy tower, it's good for you because the enemy AD carry will have a harder time last hitting. You can make it even harder for him if you harass him when he is going for a creep. Just watch out so you don't get tower aggro and look out for the enemy support because if it's someone like an Alistar, he can headbutt you under tower. You should also get the minions under the enemy tower if you kill the enemy bot lane and you want them to lose on gold and XP. The bad part about this is that you are in a very dangerous position, open to roams and jungle ganks, but you are also constantly using the mana on the wave to push it, so you won't just not have mana to fight if the enemies go on you. Uh, there's also the possibility that you won't be able to push the wave as fast and the enemies might be able to freeze it outside their tower. Then, if that happens, they can just build a ginormous wave of minions and then you won't be able to fight them, because if you do, the minions will attack you and you might take a lot of damage or even die. Watch out for minions, guys, they deal a lot more damage than people think. Sona is a champion with fairly low movement speed until she has her boots, or some points on her E, and she doesn't have access to hard CC pre-level 6. Also, I prefer to put all the pressure in lane, but if I see an opportunity to roam, I take it. Roaming includes you going to help your jungler if he gets invaded, fights in the river, warding, and of course, going to gank mid lane. Always make sure that the wave is pushed when you roam, uh, so you don't lose a golden XP to your tower. Sometimes you really have to, but avoid roaming during gun and minion waves, because they give you a lot of golden experience and you don't want to miss out on that. If you are in lane with your AD carry and you see something happening on the map, uh, first you have to worry about keeping your AD carry safe, so ping him so he knows that you're gonna leave lane, and try to type for him to back off. If he doesn't and he still tries to 1v2, uh, and he kills himself, just ignore every flame he throws at you because it was his fault. You told him that you were gonna roam, told him to back off, he didn't, it's his fault. Also, you have to be very careful with the pathing that you take and look at the map to see which enemies are gonna show up at the fight. If you see your jungler, 
is fighting the enemy jungler in the in their jungle, and you see that the mid laner uh, disappeared from the map, and that enemy support also disappeared. Don't bother to show up if you are both gonna die. It's not worth to throw your life away just because your jungler invaded at the wrong time and made a bad decision. And if he flames you because you, you didn't go, uh, just ignore. Everyone loves to blame the support for nothing. So pretty much the safest way for you to roam is when your AD carry is not in lane. After you've helped him push the wave, try to back a few seconds before him and buy your items and immediately head mid lane through the jungle and you should be able to place some deep wards and even gank mid lane while he is going back to lane. After you're done, you should be able to go back to lane, you haven't missed many CS and your AD carry should be alive. If you see your jungler is good, become his right hand man, roam with him, gank with him and deep wards with him, become best buddies, do everything with him and basically follow him around. Don't forget that you are the one who should make the shot calls and if you see a good opportunity, you can even 3 man tower dive the top laner. Always make sure that your roams count for something, even if you don't get a kill mid lane, even if you get his flash or his heal, it's still very good. Don't forget to tell your jungler that he is basically free food for the next couple of minutes. And aside from you taking away some of the jungler's job away from him, you're also taking pressure away from your team and you're putting a lot of pressure for the enemy team. Imagine how annoyed the mid laner is, um, spam pinging his bot lane, why is someone in mid lane, what the hell is going on, why don't you do anything? <laughs> Around mid game is when team fights usually start to happen, and when you do team fight, you should make sure that you have your summoners up and your ultimate up. But if you don't have these things and you see that you are very vulnerable, you either don't take team fights that you know your team is going to lose, or try to stay back really safe and use your spells and aid your team in any way you can. So you should always try to be in the back line, but sometimes you have to get closer to the heart of the team fight to get off a good ultimate. If you do have to do that, there is a little trick that I found out when I was messing around in practice mode. You can actually ult and at the exact same time you are pressing R, you can flash away and gain some distance. Your ultimate will still go off and the enemies will be stunned, but you will be once again in a safe position. Mid and late game warding, you have to do a lot of it. So here are the best spots to ward in and some tips and tricks according to the side of the map you are in. When you are winning, it's very important to place them deep wards so you know what the enemies are doing in their jungle. Warding around the dragon and the river when it, the objective is about to spawn is very important and don't forget to use your sweeper, the river plants and vision wards to deny the enemy of vision around the objective. When your team is trying to siege mid tower, don't forget to ward the river bushes and ward them over the wall like I'm doing, don't face check them. Don't forget to ward the river and these are some good spots to ward in the enemy topside jungle. When it comes to warding Baron, if you are on the blue side, you should ward right in front of Baron. The reason for this is because when the red team wants to clear it, they will have to come around the pit and that will put them at risk. On the other hand, if you are on the red side, you should ward over the wall and try to place the ward right behind Baron. This is because the ward will be obscured by Baron and since it's so close to him, the enemies will have a hard time clearing it and they are at risk of drawing aggro from, from Baron if they accidentally click him. If you are on the red side, here are some spots where you can ward in the enemy bot side jungle.
If you are winning really hard, you should ward the bushes next to the base or inside the base. Once again, don't forget to ward the river bushes, and here are some good places to ward in the enemy topside jungle. When you swap and you are top lane with your AD carry, don't forget to ward to keep him safe. If you are blue side, when warding the dry bush, it's best to uh, put the ward in the far right corner, because just look at how much more vision you get of their jungle when you put it there instead of closer to you. If you are losing really hard, ward your jungle over walls and never alone. Keep track of the buff timers because it's more than likely that the enemy jungler will try to set your jungle even farther behind by invading him. If you suspect the enemy jungler will try to steal the red buff from yours, ward around the buff when it's going to spawn within a minute and then if they do appear, uh, you will see them and if, if your team reacts, you might turn a red buff for them and a dead jungler into two kills for your team. Warding lane, especially mid, around the jungle entrances is very useful, because if you see an enemy in there, you will know in which direction he went. During the late game, Sony is an incredibly powerful champion because her cooldowns are pretty much non-existent, and she has a lot of AP at this stage, which means that she deals a lot of damage and heals for a lot. However, she is still squishy as ever, so do your best not to die. At this stage of the game, the death timers are really really big, and an ace on your team in the late game can lead to a lost game. All in all, Sony is a very fun and powerful champion. Ward and position correctly, protect your allies and show everyone that support is a role worth playing. I hope you both learned and liked this guide, and don't forget to leave a like, comment, subscribe, share, and I see you next time guys. Bye bye, love you!